Good morning, Utica. Wow. I don't know about you, I'm pumped up. Uh, one of the reasons that I had Chuck do the offertory prayer is because I knew I was pumped up. And I was pumped up before they sang that song. And I was afraid that when I got up here to do the offertory prayer, I would just bust into my sermon and we might miss that song. I am pumped up. Are you pumped up this morning? I'm excited. I wish I could say it was because I got another hour of sleep. But honestly, I got three hours less sleep this morning because I took my beautiful wife to the airport, Atlanta, this morning, early in the morning. The really good news is she bought a round-trip ticket, so she's coming back. <laughs> good news there. But as I was coming back, it was just a precious time to spend with the Lord, uh, to spend it in worship, to spend it in prayer. Uh, I rediscovered one of the things that we sang this morning that if I can be quite honest with you, there have been times in my life that I've wondered if it's true. We sang, joy comes in the morning. I am not a morning guy. There have been lots of times where I read a sentence like that and I think, uh, really, Lord? It, it comes at 10 a.m., right? Uh, but joy comes in the morning. And I've, had, I've been really having time today uh, to, to think about how God has blessed us, and to think about our brothers and sisters on the other side of the world who are being persecuted for their faith in Christ. For, for many brothers and sisters, that song that they just sang is not about year 40 AD. It's about now. It's about today. It's about what they're going through. And so I want to return to a, a verse that Tyler Johnson quoted last week and did an incredible job with as he uh, kicked off our children's choir singing for us last week. But he read Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Uh, notice what he read. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Now listen to this verse in particular. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. If you've been with us over the last several weeks, you know that we are just coming out, our most recent coming out of our most recent stint in the book of Hebrews. And we've really had a lot of focus on gathering together and being together and considering one another and remembering that we are not in this journey of the Christian life by ourselves, but we need to be mindful of those that are around us. In so many ways, we have looked at this verse individually, and we've been encouraging one another not to just live as individuals. But I want to return to that verse to kick us off this morning because we need to hear this verse corporately as well. We need to remember that Utica Baptist Church and even the American church is not the only church. We need to be mindful of our brothers and sisters on the other side of the world. We, we need to look not only to our own interests but to the interests of others. That's why we look this morning at a purposeful challenge to a persecuted church. Uh, today is the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. And I think it's, I think it's good for us as a church to take, take this particular day in the life of our calendar and think about our brothers and sisters in Christ who are being persecuted, who are suffering for the gospel, and, and remember that the church is bigger than just the church in America. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, I would encourage you to go ahead and uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Uh, Revelation is the last book of the Bible, so if you're not familiar with the Bible, you can just open it up, and you can just start from the back and flip backwards a little bit, and you'll find this passage very quickly. Uh, we're going to be looking at the letter that the Apostle John <coughs> recorded uh, for the church in Smyrna. Uh, now, if you are like most Americans, you have no idea where Smyrna is because most Americans don't have any idea where Turkey is, except on Thanksgiving Day. We find Turkey pretty quickly on Thanksgiving, but uh, I've got a map to show you of Turkey. I know this is a little bit small for you, but if you take a look at it, you'll notice that 
Israel is down in the bottom right corner, got the Mediterranean Sea there, and then there in the top portion of the map is modern-day Turkey. And if you have really good eyes, much better eyes than I do, you might be able to notice that that city that is circled there is the modern city of Izmir, which you may notice sounds a lot like Smyrna. Izmir, Smyrna, same word, same city, same place. In fact, of the, of the seven churches that are found in the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, we have these uh, seven letters to the seven churches uh, of Revelation that are there in Asia Minor, what is modern-day Turkey. But of those seven churches, those cities that are representative of those churches, Smyrna is the only one that is still an active city. And so we're going to be reading this morning from Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, a very small portion of text, but boy, boy what a mighty message God has for us as we think about uh, the, mo the modern church and the ancient church and the persecution that sometimes people have to go through for the cause of Christ. I mentioned Turkey. The Turkey has been in the news lately as it relates to persecution. You may have followed some of this story. There was a, a pastor actually originally from North Carolina who has spent the last two years in a Turkish prison. Uh, he has lived in Turkey for several years, successfully doing ministry, but in October of 2016, he was arrested. And according to the prosecution, the official crime registered against him was his Christianization. He was spreading the gospel of Jesus, and they considered that to be a crime. And he sat for two years in a Turkish prison and was really languishing there for, for many years to come, possibly. Uh, but thanks to the power of God and maybe some of the persuasion of the American government, he was recently released. And so Turkey has been in the news for Christian persecution, but as we're going to see this morning, uh, Turkey has been on the mind of God in terms of Christian persecution for a lot longer than just the last couple of years. So hopefully you have found your place in your Bible, and you can follow along in Revelation 2 as I read verses 8 to 11, and I would encourage you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. If you have a red-letter Bible, you may notice that uh, all of these words in chapters 2 and 3 are written in red. This is because this, these are messages given directly from the Lord Jesus, the resurrected Christ, who made an appearance to the Apostle John as he was in prison on the island of Patmos and asked him to pass these along to these seven churches in Asia Minor. So listen to what Jesus has to say to the church in Smyrna, beginning in verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. This is God's word for us this morning. Let's pray and ask him to use it as only he can. Father, we are grateful that you have preserved your word for us this morning. Father, I know this congregation in Smyrna was delighted to have your word of encouragement in the midst of a very dark period in their church's life. Father, I pray that as we look to your word this morning, as we continue to worship you, you alone who are worthy. Father, we, are, we, we think about our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted, those who do not enjoy freedom of religion, those who don't uh, enjoy safety when they live out their faith. Uh, Father, we pray that you would help us this morning to be mindful of them 
And Father, we pray that you might use their faithfulness and the faithfulness of brothers and sisters all throughout the ages to be a great challenge to us. And we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. You know, as we look at a text like this and as we think about an occasion like this, I think one of the natural questions for us here in America would be to ask, what does this have to do with us? What are we going to do with this? Because we are not being persecuted, at least not in the, to the extent that so many are persecuted all over the world. But I will remind you of what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. He was speaking of the last days. I do think it's important for us to remember that context and, and not, not think that this is just a universal promise for all times. But he was speaking of the last days and he said, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse. Now, we don't know if we are living in what would be specifically called the last days. We, we don't know when those days and hours are going to be, but we know that from a much broader perspective that we are indeed living in the last days. Because I believe those last days started with the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus. And those last days will continue until Christ comes again to gather his people for all of eternity. Beyond that, we don't know when the worst of the bad days are going to be. But Paul says, as we get closer and closer and closer to those last days... All who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. That's hard for us in America to read because for, for many of us, we might look at our lives over the entirety of our living and think, I don't know that I have actually been persecuted for the faith. As I was driving home from the airport this morning, I passed by Commerce, which is where my grandmother lived for her entire life. She just went to be with the Lord Jesus not too long ago. And as, as I passed by that exit, I thought about this verse, and I thought, I, I wonder if my grandmother could really say that she was persecuted because she desired to live a godly life. I'm, I'm grateful that she not only desired to live a godly life, but she lived a godly life. And she passed on that legacy to her daughter, who then helped pass it on to me. But I don't know that she encountered the kind of persecution that Paul's talking about here. And quite honestly, I haven't encountered that kind of persecution. But church, we never know when it's going to happen. We never know. If you would have told us 10 years ago what the spiritual culture of our country would be right now, most of us would not have believed it. Most of us would never have predicted the kind of turn that our country has had in which we, we really did go from living in a Christian nation, at least, at least one that has been very influenced by Judeo-Christian values and the gospel and the culture of the Bible, to the one that we are now living in, in which we experience almost the opposite of that. So we never know when it's going to come. So if you're listening this morning and, and you think, what does this have to do with me? Let me just remind you, we, we don't know when it's coming. But secondly, it has to do with our brothers and sisters, and so it has to do with us. And this message, if nothing else, will help us know how we can pray more specifically for those who are undergoing persecution. So let's, let's think about what we can do in the midst of all of this. Look, look at verse 8 again. It says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. The first thing that we need to see in the midst of persecution is, first, remember the character of Jesus. That is the most important aspect of enduring persecution, is to remember the character of Jesus. Uh, you may notice, if you've read through the book of Revelation before, that even before Jesus gets into these individual letters, he introduces himself at the end of chapter 1, 
And I, let me just read it to you. In verse 17, it says, Fear not, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forever. I have the keys of death and Hades. And then if you read those seven letters to those seven churches, you'll notice that Jesus, in the beginning of each one of those letters, once again introduces himself to the congregation so as to say, do not forget to focus first on my character. Don't get so caught up in the circumstances of the persecution that you forget the character of the Lord Jesus who is holding us. And so as we look in verse 8, it says, the words of the first and the last. We need to remember that Jesus is eternal. What that means for instances of persecution is that Jesus was there before the persecution started, and Jesus will be there after the persecution ends. No matter what problems you may be experiencing, Jesus is bigger than those problems because he's been around longer. Uh, back in chapter 1, those verses that we just read, the literal Greek says that he is the Alpha and the Omega. Maybe you've heard that and you don't really know, where does that come from? Alpha and Omega are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. The New Testament was originally written and recorded for us in Greek. And so Jesus is reminding us in the midst of persecution, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I have been around long enough to bring you comfort. We need to remember that Jesus is eternal. But then he also says in verse 8, who died and came to life. Not only is he eternal, but Jesus is alive. Amen. And you might even add a second word to that. Jesus is alive again. He died and he came to life. These words may have been particularly helpful for the church in Smyrna because uh, ancient historians tell us that the city itself had kind of a death of the city, that the city was on the brink of being wiped off of the map, and then the city itself saw kind of a revival and came back, and, and some people even took the mytholo mythological idea of the phoenix rising from the ashes and applied it to the city of Smyrna. So they saw it happening in the midst of their surroundings, and Jesus reminds them I am alive. I am the one who died and has come to life. That, that reminds the church there in Smyrna that they can face what is coming their way. It might remind them of what Job said in Job chapter 13, verse 15, where he says, Though he slay me, I will trust in him. I will trust in the Lord Jesus because he died and came to life because he is alive. So first, we must remember the character of Jesus. If we find ourselves in persecution, or as we think about our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, as they are dealing with persecution, first, we must remember the character of Jesus. But then look at verse 9. We read, I know your tribulation and your poverty and the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So after we remember the character of Jesus, or as we are remembering the character of Jesus, we also need to find respite in the comfort of Jesus. We need to find respite. That, that is a safe place. That is kind of taking a break, taking a step back from the persecution, from the tribulation, finding respite in these comforting words of Jesus. Look at what he says. I know your tribulation. Now the word in that, the original language word, is not the word in which Jesus would be saying, I understand intellectually. I, I get it. I recognize what you are going through. No, this is a very empathetic word. This is a word full of experience. This is Jesus telling his brothers and sisters who are facing persecution in Smyrna and telling you as you go through our version of persecution, our own tribulations, this is Jesus telling us, I know, I get it, I've been there, I'm right there suffering with you. 
Jesus fully understands the extent of our struggles. That's one of the things that we have seen so beautifully captured in the book of Hebrews. As we've been reminded week after week after week that Jesus is better. No matter what it is that the world is offering to us as a carrot to get us to walk away from the faith, we need to be reminded that Jesus is better. And one of the reasons that Jesus is better is because of what we read about him in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Notice what the pastor says to this struggling congregation who was considering taking the bait and walking away from Christ and walking into more comforting territory. The pastor says to them, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Church, whatever you're going through this morning, Whatever this particular period of life is throwing at you, you need to find respite in the comfort of Jesus when he says, I know your tribulation. And notice those three things he says in particular. I know your, your tribulation. This is, this is a, a, a very harsh word for persecution. This is not just affliction. This is not just some difficult patch that they are going through. This is incredible tribulation. This is, this is hard times. This is suffering. This is laying life on the line. And Jesus says, I know that. They're also dealing with poverty. He says, I know your poverty. And there are, there are several words that can capture that same idea. And some of them are to varying extent. But this particular word talks about someone who is struggling to even have the basic necessities of life. They don't even have what they need for their physical sustenance. And Jesus says, I know your poverty. But notice that parenthetical statement. It's almost as if Jesus is giving us uh, an, an opportunity to change our thinking, even with the parenthetical statement. When he says, I know your poverty, but you are rich. Even though you may view yourselves as, as being in dire poverty, church, I want to remind you, Jesus says, that through your relationship with me, you have everything that you need. You are rich. But then he also says, I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. That word slander is probably the right way to translate that word so that we don't misunderstand what is being said here, but the Greek word behind that translation of slander is the Greek word blasphemeo. Now, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to, to hear the English word behind that. It is, it is the word blasphemy. This is the Lord Jesus telling his church, I understand the blasphemy that is taking place against you. I understand that people are saying things about you that are not true and are greatly damaging to you. H historians tell us that uh, the, the early church was greatly misunderstood. They were, they were not yet their own recognized religious people. They were still really connected to the Jewish people of the synagogue. That's one of the reasons that you see the reference here to the Jewish people and to the synagogues because for most of those in this particular time, this letter would have been written uh, about the year 90 to 95 AD and even 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus, the followers of Christ in, in many cases were still connected to their Jewish roots. They were still, many of them, worshiping in the synagogues. Now, not worshiping only in the synagogues, but still connected to their way of life through the synagogue. And so um, that, that's the reference here to the blasphemy of those who claimed to be Jews. Now, don't hear what he's not saying. They ethnically were Jewish. But this is a reminder that to be truly Jewish, to be of the true Israel, uh, requires more than the right bloodline. It requires having a relationship with the Lord Jesus, being regenerated and redeemed, being adopted into the family of God. And so Jesus here is reminding them, there are people that claim to be my people, but they are not my people. 
And they were blaspheming those who were following Jesus. The ancient Christians were greatly misunderstood. For example, uh, as they observed the Lord's Supper, uh, they, they knew the hard teachings of Jesus found in John chapter 6, where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be a part of me. And so the ancient Christians were blasphemed. They were slandered against calling themselves, calling them cannibals, saying they, they participate in eating the flesh and drinking the blood. They're cannibals. Uh, they, they refused to participate in the, the worship of Caesar. And at, at this point in history, uh, the, the Caesar cult had risen to its greatest height. And really, one of the things that could get you into trouble faster than anything else would be refusing to worship Caesar as Lord or to recognize uh, the gods of the Greek systems or the Roman culture. And because the followers of Jesus denied all of those things, they were called atheists. Now get the irony of that. These are the people who follow the Lord Jesus, who have surrendered their life to the one and only, the true and living God, and they are the ones being called atheists. And believe me, church, back then it was not just name-calling. These were charges that led to death. And Jesus was telling them, I know the slander. I know the blasphemy. The timing of this is unbelievable. I could not plan this. Just this week, Christian persecution was once again in the news. Praise the Lord, it was in the news in a good way. There is a Pakistani Christian woman by the name of Asia Bibi. Asia has been in prison for more than eight years because she was charged with blasphemy. She was charged with saying negative statements about the prophet Muhammad in something that really started because she took a drink from a water bottle at a well and the other women at the well saw her as unclean. And so all of this mess started. And for eight years, she has been sentenced to death for blasphemy. And I can guarantee you that if she had a copy of God's word, if she had a copy of the New Testament, she found great comfort in the words of Jesus here in this verse with Jesus telling her, I know the slander. I know the blasphemy. But praise be unto God that even in this very, very non-Christian culture, Pakistan is within the top five of the hardest countries to live in if you are a Christian uh, Open Doors group uh, maintains a list of a top 50 every year. North Korea has been the top of the list for, for many years. Christians are suffering horribly in North Korea. Uh, but Pakistan has been right there in the top five. And even in this pagan nation, God had a victory this week. Because Asia Bibi was released. Now, it's very interesting that the Supreme Court of Pakistan released her because they said the evidence was very flimsy in her case. They say it was, it was pretty obvious. They were just uh, kind of made up charges. There was no evidence to the, to the fact that she actually had blasphemed against the prophet Muhammad. But what's interesting was they said nothing about the fact that you can be punished to death for saying unkind words about the prophet Muhammad. That's the kind of culture that our brothers and sisters are living in all over the world. And to them... Jesus says, I know. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. I know the slander of those who they say are Jews, who they say are my people, but they are not. And so we need to find respite in the comfort of Jesus, and we need to faithfully respond to the counsel of Jesus. Jesus gives instructions to the churches here in Smyrna. It's interesting, there are only one of two churches among these seven letters uh, about which Jesus has nothing negative to say. Most of the churches, Jesus says, you know, I, I want to applaud you for this. I want to commend you for these great things that you're doing, but this I have against you. For the church at Smyrna, there were no negative words, but there were words of admonition. There were words of instruction 
that the Lord Jesus brought to them. And, and so we, as we read these words and as we pray these words for our brothers and sisters, we need to faithfully respond to the counsel of Jesus. Notice what he says at the beginning of verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Those are easy words to read. I imagine they weren't easy words to listen to when they knew they were in the midst of it. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. And so we need to respond faithfully to the counsel of Jesus when he says, Be fearless. Have no fear. Remember those words that we read from Romans 8 earlier. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? What can separate us from the love of Christ? We need to be fearless. Remember what the psalmist says in Psalm 56, verse 10 and 11. It says, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Now, church, we're not facing death. But for most of us, if we're living out our faith, there is a tendency for us, too, to fear what man can do to us. Our students in school, I've said many times that they're, they're kind of ahead of the curve in swimming against the stream of culture and understanding what the, what the costs are for following Jesus. But students, you need to be reminded, man cannot do anything to you. Be fearless. Be willing to continue walking the walk following Jesus Christ. Be Fearless. Notice what Jesus said about that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. He says, do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We need to faithfully respond to the counsel of Jesus when he tells us to be fearless. But notice what else he says as we continue in verse 10, be faithful unto death. So not only does the Lord Jesus tell us to be fearless, he tells us to be faithful. He tells us to keep fighting the good fight, to keep walking the good walk, to making sure that we're following after the Lord Jesus. He tells us to be faithful. Now, if you look back at verse 8, a very interesting story here. It says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna. It's very, very possible that the actual angel, which is a translation of the word messenger, so very possibly these, these letters were written to the pastors of these churches, and it is quite possible that the pastor at the church in Smyrna, at the time that Jesus gave this message to the apostle John to then be read to the congregation in Smyrna, it is quite possible that the pastor was none other than a man named Polycarp. Now, how many of you have even heard that name before? Raise your hand if you've ever even heard the name Polycarp. This goes to show us that church history is not our greatest subject. Uh, we still have a ways to go, as many of you were not able to raise your hand. But Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, that means that he was the pastor of this church in Smyrna. We know he was the pastor uh, in the second century, but it's quite possible he was pastor as early as the late 90s in the first century AD. And so it's very possible that he was the one that received this message. And he is indeed the most famous martyr of the second century. His story is incredible. As I told you, this was, this was a time in which persecution for following Jesus was rampant. It was at an all-time high because of the Roman persecution, their desire that everyone would recognize Caesar as Lord. And so they were going around and they were collecting Christians. And they wanted to burn them at the stake. They wanted to put them to the death. And as you can imagine, they had pastors at the top of the list. 
And so uh, much of the story that I'm about to tell you is captured from a letter that the church in Smyrna wrote to a nearby congregation telling them about the faithfulness of their leader, this man named Polycarp. The word got out that the authorities were after him. They were, they were going to look for him. And so he was hiding out at, the, at a family farm, uh, not, not trying to uh, avoid following Jesus, but, but also not seeking out persecution. Uh, I think it's important for us to remember the Bible never tells us to be persecuted. The, the Bible never tells us to go out and seek persecution. And I think one of the things we need to remember the American church is that sometimes what we think is persecution is really just us acting like jerks and not be, being very nice to people and not being very courteous in our living out of the Christian faith. And so God never tells us to pursue persecution. So Polycarp was hiding out on the family farm and he spent most of those days praying. Three days before his eventual arrest, he had a dream. It was a very vivid dream in which his personal pillow was fully engulfed in flames. And he woke up that morning and he told his families, um, I will be burned at the stake. And so when the authorities did indeed find him, because uh, another one of his family members uh, ratted him out and told him where they could find him, they come to the farm. And even though he had opportunities to flee, he did not. He knew it was God's will for him to go ahead and, and face the authorities who were seeking out his life. And as they arrived, he simply asked, can I have some time to pray alone with the Lord? Can you give me one hour to pray? And they granted him that one hour, uh, mainly because he was a man very, very up in his years. And uh, he, he prayed not one hour, but two hours. And many of those who were there to arrest him were, were convicted by the purity and the passion of his prayers, and they even repented. But some did not, and so he was arrested, and he was taken back to Rome where he faced the authorities. And the authorities begged him, why won't you just recant? What can it hurt for you to say, Caesar is Lord? Why, why can't you say it? You need to do it, old man. Curse Christ. That was the command. If you just curse Christ, we will let you go. You can enjoy the rest of your life. And this is what Polycarp said. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Polycarp was faithful. He said, I will not deny Christ. I will not curse Christ. They continued to encourage him. And he says, if you vainly suppose that I shall swear by the fortune of Caesar, if you don't know who I am, then listen plainly. I am a Christian. Church, do we have that kind of faithfulness even unto death? That we can stand in the midst of the worst persecution and be faithful in following the Lord Jesus. You might ask, how can anyone do that? How can anyone look in the eye of persecution even unto the death and be faithful to the Lord Jesus? I, I think it's because Polycarp was focused on the rewards of his covenant with Jesus. He was faithfully responding to the counsel of Jesus because he was focused on the rewards of his covenant with Jesus. Notice, notice what we read in the scriptures as we continue that same verse. In verse 10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. That's what Polycarp knew was coming to him. He had his eyes on the reward that only Jesus could offer to him. His eyes were on the crown of life. And then notice again what Jesus says in verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So not only did Polycarp have his eyes on the crown of life, 
he also saw before him the conquering of death. He would not recant. He would not turn his back on the Lord Jesus. And so they said, you're going to have to be burned at the stake. And so they went to nail him to the stake on which he would be burned. And he said, you don't need to nail me to the stake. If the Lord can hold me in this hour, he can keep me from moving away from the stake. You do not have to tie me or nail me. So they didn't nail him to the stake. They did tie him, but they, they avoided the nails because they believed him. And the crowds who were there, many of whom were Christians that were eventually in some of these churches that, that told this story, the crowd said that the Roman authorities went to light the fire. And as they lit the fire, they saw something miraculous happen around Polycarp. As they were trying to burn him, they say that the flames engulfed around him as if to make the shape of a sail all around him filled with wind. And they recognized he is not going to be burned. God is not going to allow him to be burned. And so they instead pierced him with a sword. And all of that happened because he saw the conquering of death. And you may, you may hear that story and think, well, what are you talking about, the conquering of death? He, he still died. That was his last day. But he knew there was waiting in heaven for him the crown of life. And when they were threatening him with that fire, this is what he said. The fire that you threaten burns but an hour and is quenched after a little. For you do not know the fire of the coming judgment. Why do you delay? Do what you will. Church, do you have that kind of confidence in your relationship with Christ? Have you surrendered your life to the life of Jesus? Can you testify to what our choir sang earlier this morning, my life is in your hands. Here's the good news of the gospel. We are able to say, my life is in your hands because God, the heavenly father said, your sin is in my son. And Jesus suffered the wrath for us. Jesus paid the consequences of our sin that through trusting in him, we too might receive the crown of life. We too might experience the conquering of death. And we too, like Polycarp and so many others in the early church and so many others in the churches all over the world today, can be focused on the rewards of the covenant with Jesus to receive the crown of life and the conquering of death. Let me remind you what Jesus said in Revelation 1, verses 17 and 18. Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus has the keys to death and Hades. The question for you this morning is, does he have your heart? Does he have your life? Is your life in his hands? And if our life is in his hands, then we too can sing with the saints all throughout the ages, amazing grace. My chains are gone. The world may try to shackle me, but I have the freedom and the life that is available in Christ. Let's pray together.